and a business without one. Well, what about a blog? And perhaps more to the point, what is it? A blog, or literally weblog, started as a personal online diary of the author's thoughts and experiences. Now businesses are finding the blog a useful tool for talking to customers, and they're starting blogs of their own, discussing their products, major developments and industry trends. This morning we look at why and whether the corporate world can afford to ignore the so-called blogosphere. Meet the Arigos, three generations of the family and three generations of bloggers. There's Dad or Frank Arigo, a self-confessed geek. The kids, 12-year-old Billy and Emma, who's eight. And the grandmother, Alma Bryce. You haven't done any links though, Billy. You've got a link to my blog. At any one time, you can find Frank or Billy or Alma or even Emma updating their personal blogs for family, friends or just keen blog browsers. I guess what we get out of it is we're able to keep in touch. It's no surprise Frank works in the IT industry and he runs a corporate blog, one of 2,000 Microsoft bloggers around the world. It's really no different from the, the family blog where I'm talking to my family members who want to know about the kids and what we're doing. The, the corporate one's exactly the same. They want to know what Microsoft's up to and what events are happening, what's happening in the community. Is it a sales tool from a corporate point of view? Well, look, it, it can be seen as a sales tool. Um, really, the way it, it's, it's evolved for me it's, and, and my team, it's really evolved as, as a, a communications tool to our customers. I, I think the running of a, of a comprehensive blog is an incredibly important way of attracting attention to yourself and your organisation. Simon Van Wick is a pioneer of web marketing. It is your opportunity to publish your expertise on a daily basis. Globally, there are around 27 million blogs, but that changes literally by the minute. A year ago, there were 8 million. Most of them are personal. Corporate blogs are thin on the ground. And if they don't pass the smell test, they don't last. There's a term called flog, you know, which stands for fake blog. And there's a lot of those floating around where, you know, they make up a person and that person represents the company and then they write the stories about X, Y and Z. And very, very quickly you can smell through that. It's an ad campaign rather than someone speaking from the company. What makes a good corporate blog? Well, a good corporate blog would be, I mean, there are some good examples of them overseas like General Motors and, and stuff where, and it's where you where you feel that you're talking to the person who's responsible for the area you're interested in whether it's developing a product or uh, or you know, involved in customer service so it's a very personal relationship. Trevor Cook runs a PR agency and a corporate blog. He's not alone in his admiration of the General Motors site. Called Fastlane, it's written by the car maker's vice chairman. The blog that I went, went, he went to a motor show and he saw the new range of General Motors cars and he wasn't really as happy with the one as he thought he might be when he finally saw it on a stand. And I thought, well, that's pretty candid opinion from the guy. But what he's done is he's given people an opportunity to engage with him, to talk to him. What Van Wick sees on the GM blog is what Trevor Cook wants from his own version. I'm regularly in the sort of top 20 or 30 PR blogs in the world. So. Engaging the reader means engaging a potential customer through everything from Cook's professional views to personal passions. I think we are starting to see a dollar benefit. We've certainly helped us win at least one client. People can see what they are going to get before they come along. It's the same for Frank Arrigo at Microsoft. The blog is a direct line to customers and it gives the corporate monolith a face. I think the, the blogs really allows us to humanise the company and people get to know who we are. But while blogs are direct, they can be dangerous. Some geek found a way of picking this very expensive bicycle lock with a ballpoint pen and posted it on his blog and the company denied it and within days the entire blogosphere knew about this bike lock, the company's share price crashed, they denied it, the blogs went on and it just multiplies. To blog or not to blog? For a business it's a lot more complicated than writing a personal journal. Who in the company actually does the blogging? Who has the time and the expertise? How much information do they put out? What happens if they're bombarded with negative feedback? And how do they keep control?
blog smart, you know, is really what we say. So th that's kind of our guidelines. The way what I, does it mean? It, what, what it means is the way I interpret that is if I don't want to see something on the front page of the Sydney Morning Herald or the Fin Review, I don't blog it. <laughs> it's basically as simple as that. Australia's biggest corporate blogger is Telstra. Uh, in terms of responses coming back to our blogs once the blog is posted, um, we don't really have any, uh, we don't vet them in any way, shape or form. The Telstra blog is new and blogging evangelists claim it doesn't yet qualify as a real blog. For one thing, they say, the posts are too long and too infrequent. Paul Crisp admits it's a work in progress, but maintains the blog is transparent even though bloggers are hand-picked by the company. When they sign on to become a blogger, and I say that figuratively, there's no contract that they enter into, uh, they basically have the guidelines that sets out uh, uh, some, some very sort of broad uh, brushstroke framework of how they should blog and what a blog is, and uh, they basically enter into the arrangement knowing that uh, knowing how, what they're going to talk about on a regular basis. So again, we don't provide any form of censorship in, in, in terms of blogging as such. The potential conflict between protecting the brand and being transparent is at the heart of the blogging debate. The whole idea of a corporate blog, which is sanitised and checked by, um, by, by risk managers, is an oxymoron. Once you start putting in place um, re uh, regulation uh, to, to tone down the expression, if you like, or um, minimise the potential damage, you're, you're essentially um, censoring a blog, which seems to me uh, contradictory in terms. David Redhill works for accountants Deloitte. They so, considered their own corporate blog, but um, decided against it. By unleashing a new medium, which really is, 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 is extremely powerful because it's worldwide audience, um, and allowing people to use that in an unregulated manner is, is really uh, a, a huge risk. You're becoming a publisher, so you need to know that anything that goes up there, no matter how you got it or with what authority you thought uh, you were receiving it, um, will come back to you as the publisher. Specialist internet lawyer Patrick Fair says the risks are clear. Defamation and copyright infringements are just two examples, and blogging has an added problem. It's also about opinion, and I think opinion is a riskier area than uh, posting facts or details or technical specifications. People are much more likely to honestly mean what they say but defame somebody or something in the course of saying it. For many companies, blogging will require a change of culture. They'll be literally inviting the critics in. But the blog believers say that won't stop the corporate blog soon being as common as the website. So for a corporate, can you afford to not be in that space? You can't, because if, it's, if you're not talking about it, other people are, either it's your competitors or your customers. Blogger Frank Arrigo, and that's Business Sunday for today. Sunday is next with an update on the AWB scandal and studio guest Labour leader Kim Beasley. I'm Ali Moore.